Just because somebody can manipulate the very fabric of reality itself at a moment's notice, it doesn't mean their life isn't subject to a series of rules, or at least guidelines, which they're required to follow for one reason or another. And so, with that in mind then, I'm Ellie with What Culture here with 10 crazy in-universe rules MCU characters must follow. Number 10. Celestials don't interfere in human affairs Let's kick things off with one of the most common complaints in the MCU, that as the franchise has expanded its roster of ultra-powerful superheroes, it's become tougher to explain why these beings haven't helped out the frontline Avengers in major Earth conflicts. In the case of the Celestials, however, an attempt has been made to hand-wave this plot hole by affirming that the Celestials and their adjacent creations are bound by an oath not to interfere in human affairs. In Marvel's What If animated series, the Watcher reiterates that he cannot and will not interfere in the events he observes, while in Eternals, the Celestial Arishem will only allow the Eternals to involve themselves in earthly affairs if the Deviants are part of the conflict. This flimsy rationale becomes even more twisted when it's later revealed that Arishem actually posted the Eternals on Earth to kill the Deviants and ensure the planet became populated enough for the emergence to happen, which would in turn birth the new Celestial Tiamat. Granted, Celestials are so far beyond the realm of a typical living things experience that we can't imagine this oath bothers them all that much, what with the universe being as endlessly vast as it is and humanity a mere speck on it. Number 9. The Sokovia Accords are still trying to hold superheroes accountable Captain America Civil War introduced the notion of the Sokovia Accords, a series of internationally ratified laws which would regulate superheroes' actions around the globe, and causes the central conflict between Team Cap and Team Iron Man. Though the Avengers had far more pressing threats to deal with during Infinity War and Endgame, the Accords haven't gone anywhere and are still very much active. This was confirmed in one division when Jimmy Woo mentions that Scarlet Witch violated the Accords by stealing Vision's remains. While there's certainly a theoretically compelling argument to be made for superhero oversight, the reality is that there are now so many known superheroes on and around Earth of varying power sets that asking them to sign a legally binding document can't help but seem a bit comical. As such, it's perhaps not terribly surprising that the Accords have been pushed to the storytelling wayside in recent years, having fulfilled their narrative purpose and now only quietly existing in the background. In theory, though, the MCU's finest heroes still have to stick to the regulations or risk being flagged as fugitives operating outside of the law. Number 8. Avengers must behave or lose merchandising opportunities Though the MCU as a whole hasn't explored this angle in any detail, it's clear that the Avengers are now massively lucrative merchandise commodities in their own right, with millions if not billions of fans around the world. Yet Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness makes it abundantly clear that the opportunities afforded to the heroes are entirely dependent on their behaviour, not unlike any famous person bound to a certain code of conduct by their employer. Early in the film, Doctor Strange tells Scarlet Witch that if she helps him protect America Chavez, it'll get her back on the lunchbox. The implication, obviously, is that Wanda was removed from Avengers merchandise following the events of WandaVision, where she enslaved an entire town while grieving Vision's death. But it does beg a few questions. First and foremost, is there a specific code of conduct that superheroes must adhere to in order to benefit from merch opportunities? And more to the point, who the hell is in charge of coordinating all of that? While interest in merch revenue is likely to vary wildly between the Avengers, it's difficult to picture Thor giving much of a damn, it does appear that the heroes are subject to diminished revenues if they veer too far from the squeaky clean heroic course. Number 7. Wakandans Don't Use Guns one of the defining traits of the Wakandan army is that they're basically the only modern army around the world that doesn't use guns. Despite their technologically advanced nature, they eschew traditional projectile weapons entirely. This is in large part due to their vibranium-laced arsenal, namely their spears and gauntlets, producing sonic blasts capable of causing massive amounts of damage. You can also argue that Wakanda's isolationist nature has basically prevented them from ever having to engage in long-range war and most of their internal qualms are settled through ritualistic combat anyway, therefore negating the necessity for guns. The army is clearly still equipped for a fight with far-flung forces through their vibranium-infused tech, but to the layperson, their lack of conventional firearms seems positively suicidal. 
Number six, black widows are forcibly sterilized. Perhaps no Avenger has had a more devastating backstory than Black Widow, who reveals in Avengers Age of Ultron that as part of her training to become a Black Widow assassin, she was sterilised before graduating. Natasha says that it's efficient and one less thing to worry about, though it's clear that she was left hugely traumatised by both the sterilisation and her general experiences being trained as a widow. This is further explored in her solo movie, where her adoptive sister Yelena graphically explains to their father figure Alexa what the involuntary hysterectomy procedure entails. As if transforming orphan girls into elite assassins wasn't sinister enough, removing their reproductive options in order to make them more pliable and less of a flight risk is just seven shades of effed up. Considering the callousness of Red Room leader General Drakov, it's safe to assume that any widow who rejected the procedure would have either been disposed of or, once mind control measures were instituted following Natasha's escape, simply made to submit to it. Number 5. Changing the past doesn't change the future Avengers Endgame was a masterful exercise in fan service, courtesy of its brilliant central time heist, even if the film's wacky time travel rules cause quite the headache for fans. While classic time travel movies such as Back to the Future adhere to the logic that changing your past will effectively rewrite your present according to any changes made in the past, Endgame says that that's a bunch of hooey. As Bruce Banner rather awkwardly explains, the MCU's time travel laws prevent the changing of the past, rather travelling back in time and making changes will simply create a new branching alternate timeline, while the original Doom timeline stays intact. This is why they didn't, as Rhodey suggests, simply kill Thanos as a baby, because it would only create a new timeline without rectifying Thanos' existing damage in the Prime timeline. And so that's why they have to retrieve the Infinity Stones from the past, use them to unsnap half the universe, and then return them to their original time stream, ensuring everything remains in temporal tact. It's certainly an interesting take on time travel and surely not what most expected from Endgame's timey-wimey shenanigans, even if it arguably just makes things even more of a headache for the heroes to figure out. Number 4. Doctor Strange still mostly practices the Hippocratic Oath before he became a badass sorcerer, Stephen Strange was a medical doctor who, like all doctors, adhered to the field's code of ethics known as the Hippocratic Oath. The most salient and oft-repeated part of the oath is do no harm, a mantra which Strange clings to even once he takes up the mystic arts. After killing one of Caecilius' followers, Lucian, in the original Doctor Strange film, he expresses tremendous remorse, reiterating to the Ancient One that he took an oath to save lives, not end them. Though Strange has certainly softened his no-harm stance over the years as the world's threats have become greater and more multiversal, he generally still only directly kills his foes when he absolutely positively has to, more often using magic to subdue them. Granted, the mere act of fighting itself causes harm if you want to get technical, but let's face it, he's usually protecting either himself, his fellow Avengers, or the Earth itself whenever he gets forceful, right? Considering that most of Strange's fellow Avengers wouldn't bat an eye eyelid when it comes to taking lives, this trait differentiates Strange in a way that isn't talked about nearly enough. Number 3. Ravagers Don't Steal From Other Ravagers in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, it's stated several times that the otherwise ruthless band of mercenaries known as the Ravagers have a strict code of honour which its members must adhere to. Yondu is said to have broken the Ravager code by kidnapping Peter Quill from his family as a child, and Yondu and Peter also remark that Ravagers do not steal from other Ravagers. While the former rule makes sense, the latter is pretty hilarious. The Ravagers are permitted to do horribly unscrupulous things in the pursuit of a buck, but still from a fellow Ravager? Nope, too far. Considering that Stakar Ogord says there are 100 Ravager factions throughout the galaxy, it's difficult to believe that Ravager bylaw can even be realistically enforced among them. Sure, there might be some sort of kangaroo court where these matters can be decided, but given that these are the only two Ravager rules we've been made acutely aware of, there's got to be bigger priorities than theft, right? Like, you know, don't kill another Ravager or something? When you're this deep down the moral rabbit hole, turning your nose up at robbery of all things just seems a bit farcical. Number 2. Bruce Banner is celibate 
In 2008's The Incredible Hulk, it's made clear that Bruce Banner can't have sex with Betty Ross for fear of hulking out and, well, killing her. This is reiterated in Avengers Age of Ultron, where Bruce is unable to consummate his relationship with Black Widow due to the fatal potential of him getting excited and becoming the big green guy. Now, while Banner managed to successfully merge himself and Hulk into Professor Hulk or Smart Hulk by the time of Avengers Endgame, that seemingly didn't do much to change his celibacy vow. Initially, anyway. Though Banner clearly exerts far greater control over his Hulk form, at this point in time he's still very much bound to the physicality of the Hulk, and so it's impossible to see how he can have sex with a human woman. Yet there is a sliver of hope. Banner inexplicably appeared in human form in Shang-Chi, yet is shown as Professor Hulk once again in the She-Hulk trailers, perhaps suggesting that Banner has found a way to switch between the two forms at will. As it stands though, Banner's celibacy is is most likely still intact. It doesn't seem probable that Banner would risk a sexual encounter unless he was 100% sure he could stay human without even the faintest possibility of hulking out. Hopefully She-Hulk will shed light on this deeply pressing matter when it premieres later this summer. Number 1. Shield Agents Must Allow Their Likeness To Be Duplicated being a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent sure seems like a lot of hard work, and while the agents are obviously bound to confidentiality agreements regarding the insane sights they're privy to, they also have to consent to something with potentially deeply discomforting implications. The Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. series has provided numerous glimpses of life model decoys, androids that can perfectly replicate every aspect of a living person down to the most minute detail. LMDs are typically used to create distractions or serve in place of the real agents in a dangerous situation, which sounds fantastic in theory. However, it also presents a system ripe for abuse, especially considering that S.H.I.E.L.D. has been surreptitiously infiltrated by HYDRA for literally decades. Evidently, somewhere in a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent's contract, they have to consent to having their likeness imitated for, well, whatever purpose the organization wishes. While the life-saving potential speaks for itself, so too does the prospect of major harm. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed anything, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there. And I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with What Culture. I hope you have a magical day and I'll see you real soon.